This video will be all about double pendulums. These fascinating physical systems can seem random, but in fact illustrate one of the most counterintuitive ideas in all of physics and mathematics. A system can be unpredictable, yet still entirely deterministic. You may have already encountered a double pendulum before, but here we'll derive the equations of motion, see how each of the angles evolve over time depending on the initial conditions, and learn just what it means for a double pendulum to be both unpredictable and deterministic. We'll start with a ball of mass M1 attached to a rod of length L1, which is fixed at the other end, creating a pivot point. We also have a mass M2 attached to another rod of length L2, where L2 is fixed to M1 at its other end. We'll treat M1 and M2 as point particles and assume they are much heavier than both rods, so we can effectively treat them as being massless rigid rods. Next, we'll pick a coordinate system and label the positions of each of the masses as well as the angles the rods make with the y-axis. The last thing we'll assume is that gravity is present. So our goal here is to derive the equations that will govern the motion of this system. In order to do so, we'll have to follow three steps. First, write down the kinematic constraints. These are the constraints of the system without regard to any forces. In step two, we'll use the results from step one to write down the Lagrangian of this system, which will consist of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. We could also use Newton's second law to add up all the forces and solve for the acceleration, but the derivation using the Lagrangian approach turns out to be much simpler. Finally, in step three, we'll use the Lagrangian to solve the Euler-Lagrange equation. The result will be the equations of motion that describe the trajectory of this system. So let's write down the kinematic constraints. By applying some trigonometry, we can write the cosine of theta one and the sine of theta one. We can also do the same for theta two. Then doing some slight rearranging, we now have an expression for x1, y1, x2, and y2. We'll also need a similar expression for velocities when we write down the kinetic energy in the Lagrangian. We can find that by just taking the derivative with respect to time of each coordinate. Okay, now we can write down the Lagrangian. The kinetic energy of the total system will just be the sum of the kinetic energies of each particle. And of course, kinetic energy is just one half times the mass times the velocity squared. So we can write that down for each particle. And in terms of our coordinate system, it becomes the following. Then we'll plug in the expressions we found in step one to get this result for the total kinetic energy. Next, we need to find the potential energy. The potential energy for each particle is just mgh, where g is the gravitational constant and h is the height above some chosen ground level. In our coordinate system, the ground level is the height of the pivot attached to L1. So the height for particle 1 is negative L1 times cosine theta 1, which results in a potential energy of negative m1 times g times L1 cosine of theta 1. And for particle two, its height is negative one times L1 cosine of theta one plus L2 cosine of theta two. So we get this expression for its potential energy, which leads to the following for the total potential energy. Now the Lagrangian of the system is the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So we can combine these results to get this expression. Okay, now that we have our Lagrangian in hand, we are ready to write down the Euler-Lagrange equation. This is given by partial L by partial theta minus D by DT of partial L by partial theta dot equals zero. Before solving this, I'd like to give some brief motivation for where this equation comes from. There is a powerful principle that shows up almost everywhere in physics known as the principle of least action. What it says is that of all the possible paths that a particle could take, the one that it will always take is the one that minimizes the action which is defined as the integral of the Lagrangian. And the Euler-Lagrange equation is the condition that needs to be satisfied for the action to be minimized. Now I can't stress enough how ubiquitous the principle of least action is. It shows up in general relativity, classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and other areas too. 
In fact, it's so important that many physicists think it's more fundamental than the actual equations of motion. There's a lot more that can be said about this, which would warrant an entire video. But if you want to learn more about it now, I suggest looking up Feynman's lecture on it. He gives a detailed analysis of what the principle of least action is, while also providing nice intuition along the way. Okay, so let's plug in the double pendulum Lagrangian into the Euler-Lagrange equation. We'll do this separately for theta 1 and theta 2. Starting with theta 1, the first term says to take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta 1. And since theta 1 and theta 1 dot are independent variables here, we get this expression. We can also cancel the 2s and combine the last two terms to get a simplified form. For the second term, we'll first take the derivative of L with respect to theta 1 dot. Again, we can cross out the 2s and combine like terms to simplify. Next, we need to take the derivative of this with respect to time. All that's left is to subtract the bottom equation from the top equation, resulting in the Euler-Lagrange equation for theta 1 equaling this. And once more, we can further simplify by crossing out L1 and also multiplying by negative 1 to get rid of all the negative signs. Now let's do the same for theta 2. Again, starting with the first term, partial L by partial theta 2 equals this, which can be further simplified as before. And for the second term, partial L by partial theta 2 dot is this. And d by dt of this results in the following. Again, we subtract the bottom equation from the top equation and further simplify by crossing out L2 and all the M2s. So our entire solution consists of these two equations. These are the equations of motion that describe how the trajectory of the double pendulum will evolve over time. Now these equations cannot be solved analytically, but you can code them up and solve them numerically. So let's do that and see what the motion looks like. First, we'll set the initial conditions. We'll let the masses be equal, the lengths be equal, and the angles as well. Initially, the motion seems somewhat simple, but it gradually becomes more and more complicated and eventually appears random. But remember, this is produced entirely from equations that are deterministic. Let's try another starting point. Here we get a very complicated motion from the get-go. Okay, next, let's take a look at what happens if we set our initial angle to be really small. Not very exciting, right? But look at what happens if we plot the angles against one another. We get this amazing curve. Interestingly, with the small angle approximation, the equations that govern this system reduce to being just a linear system of equations. And consequently, the motion is greatly simplified. In fact, each half of the double pendulum is just undergoing simple harmonic motion. That's right, the harmonic motion you learned about in freshman physics is showing up here again. We can visualize this nicely if we plot theta 1 and theta 2 separately over time. You can see that each of them follow a simple sine or cosine curve that are completely out of phase with each other. This represents the energy being transferred cyclically between the two particles that make up the pendulum. Okay, next, let's see what happens if we set up two double pendulums with a small initial angle, but this time slightly change the initial conditions of one of them as well. Again, nothing too exciting occurs in the small angle approximation. But once more, if we plot the angles, we get a similar type of interesting curve. And since there's not much of a difference between the two motions, once we know the motion of one pendulum, we can introduce small changes and still accurately predict what the subsequent motion will look like. This means that when the small angle approximation is valid, the motion is both predictable and deterministic. But let's see what happens if we increase the initial angle. At first, the paths are very similar, 
but eventually the paths of each pendulum diverge substantially from each other. The system has now become extremely nonlinear and its motion is chaotic. To be chaotic means that by only having slight modifications in initial conditions, the evolution of the system drastically diverges. Now what about if we plotted how the angles change over time? The chaotic behavior becomes even more apparent with this plot. And we can even get an additional view of the drastic difference between the two pendulums if we plot theta 1 versus theta 2. Finally, we can even get a quantitative sense of just how different the motions are. Here we'll plot the distance between each point particle throughout the evolution. So what I've plotted here is the sum of the Euclidean distance between each of the corresponding particles. And although the total distance oscillates, there is a clear upwards trend. Now I think it is evident why the double pendulum is a classic example of a physical system being chaotic. In fact, a double pendulum is so chaotic that its motion is inherently unpredictable, even though it is governed by deterministic equations. How unpredictable is it? To get an idea, let's now set up five double pendulums. These will be the coordinates of the first pendulum. Then we'll introduce an 0.1% difference, an 0.01% difference, an 0.001% difference, and finally, a difference that's 10 to the negative 4%. And if we wait just a few seconds, we can see that the paths of all five of them drastically diverge from each other. Okay, let's do this one more time and we'll add five more pendulums. So we have a total of 10 now. The difference in initial conditions here will now range from 0.1% all the way down to just a 10 to the negative 9% difference. And again, even with this incredibly small difference, we get a drastically different outcome for each of the pendulums. We could of course continue with this process and keep making smaller and smaller differences. And although we'd have to wait a bit longer each time, the result will always be the same. No matter how arbitrarily small of a difference you make, the resulting motion will be substantially different. Essentially, you'd need to have infinite precision of the initial conditions to be able to predict the subsequent motion. This is what makes the double pendulum such a fascinatingly unpredictable yet deterministic system.